was beautiful. It was uh, the sound of a, a thousand rushing winds and blowing across a screeching blackboard. And <laughs> you can see Madeline's face. <laughs> <laughs> he sounded okay to me, Tracy. <laughs> That's good. She's yeah, I was going to say, oh, oh. Oh, all the people, all, all the people that can't hear thought I sounded great. So that's that's good. That's good. Madeline, who has good ears, she thought I was terrible. See, the issues were solved. Tammy just said, Pam texted me and said they had issues with their guests, so they might be late. So, so see, that's. I never do this. For a little. I I don't. I don't invite strangers into my house because that's, that's why Pam and George never come. So, um, All right, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy 1 and verse number 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God be honor and glory <coughs> Excuse me, forever and ever. Amen. Let's bow our hearts down in a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the opportunity that we have this morning of looking at your word and of studying it together. And as we do so now, we pray that the things said and done would honor and glorify the name of Christ and edify the saints. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, as I said, we want to continue our study on um, these four faithful sayings in Paul's epistles. There are four places in Paul's epistles where he says this is a faithful saying. Uh, and this is the first of those here in 1 Timothy chapter 1. We talked a little bit last week about what a faithful saying is. A saying is something that, that we repeat often. Generally, we repeat it because it's it's found generally to be true um, like a stitch in time saves nine red at night sailors delight um, uh, you know um, a, a rolling stone gathers no moss you know all those little things that we say probably that your grandparents taught you to say um, those are sayings they're just things that people have found generally to be true through the years and so they become sayings, something that we repeat often so a saying is just something that you repeat often a faithful saying, as opposed to most of the sayings that we have, um, is something that you can rely on every time. Sayings become sayings because they are generally true, but not necessarily always true every time. But a faithful saying, a saying of God in the scripture, is a saying that is always true, that you can always count on, that you can always rely on, and something that should be repeated because it is faithful, because it is reliable, because you can count on it. And this saying uh, that we're looking at, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. That's the, the focus of it, the heart of it. Now last week we went down to verse 17 because if you're going to say that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, it's important to understand who Christ Jesus is. And down in verse 17 Paul says, Unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. So he talks about God, and, and as we saw last week, and we spent the whole time talking about this and didn't really get to the, the meat of the saying in verse 15, this is, this is an important part of understanding why the faithful saying is a faithful saying, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. To understand who Christ was and is, uh, you, really, you really need to understand Stand that to understand the impact and the import of him coming into the world to save sinners. Um, let's get two passages. Get John chapter 1 and get Colossians chapter 1. These two passages, one from the Gospels, presenting it from uh, the perspective of the nation Israel, and one from Paul's epistles, presenting it from the perspective of the Gentiles, describe Christ and describe what he is and who he is. John says in John chapter 1 verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we, Jesus Christ, the word was made flesh and in flesh we beheld the glory of the Father, which the glory of the Father is defined there in this passage when we went back in the Old Testament last week and looked at it. It's grace and truth. Those are the two primary qualities and characteristics of God that make him who he is. He is a God of grace 
And he's a God of truth. He told Moses uh, when he hit him in the cleft of the rock, uh, the Lord gracious and long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. So that's his grace. He forgives iniquity and transgression and sin, who will by no means clear the guilty. That's his truth. Although he's a forgiving God, he's also a God of justice and truth, and he can't just overlook sin and let it go. There must be a payment made, and we're going to talk more about that today. Then in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15, Speaking of Christ, Paul says, who is the image of the invisible God. So, as John is saying, those, those invisible qualities of God, grace and truth, are made manifest in the flesh in Jesus Christ. So, Paul says that he is the image of the invisible God. So, if you want to see a God that is invisible, you look at Christ he is the image of that invisible God. In chapter 2 of Colossians, uh, in verse 10, I'm sorry, verse 9, For in him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him. So, in him, it, the, all the fullness of God, all the grace of God, all the truth of God, all that God is dwells in Christ in a bodily form. And we can see it, and in and, and, and his earthly ministry, people could touch him and, and, and know that he was real and see, he said, uh, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So the qualities that are God's are, are in Christ in a visible form. He is the image of of the invisible God. He is the, the part of the invisible God that we can see. He is the manifestation, if you will, of the invisible God that we can see. So that's who we're dealing with. And if you go back to 1 Timothy now, um, we're not going to spend a lot of time. Paul says, uh, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Uh, and we're not going to have a lot of time to get into to the idea of what it means that Paul was chief. It doesn't, just to say briefly, it doesn't mean that he was worse than any other sinner. But it means he was a leader of sinners. He led sinners in their rebellion against God. Um, he it was that, that uh, the witnesses that stoned Stephen laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And Saul went breathing with letters from the high priest um, that if he found any of this way, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Uh, and that is any of the way of worshiping Jesus Christ. He was a leader of sinners. He was a leader of the rebellion against God. He was a leader of of the Jewish religion that wanted to stamp out the name of Christ. So when he says, of whom I am chief, he's the, he's the chief of sinners, not in the, uh, the extent of his sin, but in the fact that he's leading sinners. It's, a, it's an issue of the position that he had of leading sinners. But we want to spend most of the time, obviously, in, in the, the heart of that, uh, that faithful saying, and it's worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So this Christ that is the manifestation of God, that is the bodily um, image of God, he came into the world. Now keep your hand here in 1 Timothy, just flip back to Philippians chapter 2. Paul's explanation of that, Paul's description of Jesus Christ coming to the world is in Philippians chapter 2. And he says it this way in verse 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So he's speaking of Christ, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, he says in verse 5, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now that's, that's the way Paul expresses the position that Christ had. And, and, and it simply means this, for, for Jesus Christ to claim equality with God was not robbing anything from God. It wasn't taking anything away from God. When he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. When Paul said, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Everything that is in God is in Christ. If, if, if I were to say, or, or any of you were to stand up and say, you know what? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And in me dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. If you've seen me, and you've seen how I live, and you've seen how I act, and you've heard the words that I say, then you've been in the presence of God. It wouldn't be you. See, Rhonda's laughing. She says, he said, God has red hair. <laughs> oh, he does. He's a flame of fire. What color is fire? I rest my case. I rest my case. I rest my case. So, you know, that's why there's so few of us, because we are the godly ones. So, um, 
So, to, for us to claim equality with God would be robbing something from him, even us redheads. It would be robbing something from God. But Jesus Christ could claim equality with God, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. It was, it was not robbery in any way for Jesus Christ to say, if you've seen me, if you, you've seen the Father. It was not robbery in any way for Jesus Christ to say, I and the Father are one. It was not robbery in any way for Paul to say about Christ, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. It was not robbery in any way for John to say, um, we beheld his glory, the glory is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. It was not robbery in any way, but... He, verse 6, verse 7, made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. So, even though it was not robbery for him to be God, and to be equal with God, and to consider himself equal with God, he, he, he set aside that deity. He set aside the, the exercise of his deity and became a man. And he humbled himself... He made himself in reputation and was, took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So Christ Jesus, this is the coming into the world part. Christ Jesus came into the world. That is, he became a man. The creator became like the creature. The one who had created heaven and earth became a part of heaven and earth. The one who had breathed life into the lump of clay, that it became a living soul, became one of those lumps of clay, became a living soul. So we understand who Christ is. We understand him coming into this world. The other key element of that verse is that Christ Jesus came into the world. Now, theologians, they call that because they like to be fancy and use words that because then we all say, wow, he really knows what he's talking about. He's got three degrees and, you know, all that. They call that the hypostatic union. The hypostatic union is just the theologian's fancy way of saying that he was truly God because he, he, was, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but he was truly man. That is, he, he uh, was made in the likeness of men. So even though he's truly God... He's made in the likeness of men. And he is the only being that ever has had that form. He is unique in that. God is God and man is man. But there is one being that is the God-man, Jesus Christ. He is the son of man, but he is also the son of God. And, and as I said, theologians call that the hypostatic union. And that's one of the great... You know, if you look at the early, early, early church, that was one of the great debates. Who was Christ and what was he? Was he half man and half God or was he all man and no God or what? He is truly God, never lost. He, he, he lost, he set aside, he didn't lose, he set aside the exercise of his deity. He's no longer seated at the right hand of the Father. He is no longer that position of glory that he had but he's still God. He still retains grace and truth. Because in the flesh we see grace and truth. And in him we see all the fullness of the Godhead. So he didn't lose the fullness of the Godhead, grace and truth. But he exhibits that as a man in a body of flesh. The other key in this verse, verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. So the other thing we have to define is Sinners. What is a sinner? I said that at Glasgow. What is a sinner? Bob B. Bunt. You know, but but not really, right? Because Bob isn't a sinner anymore, is he? He's a saint now. So so it's you know you got that debate. You know when we sing the song, "Only a sinner saved by grace." Well, I and and that the, the I am only a sinner saved by grace. I am a sinner saved by grace. I am a sinner. Are you? No. Yeah, so the song really should say, I am a saint that's been saved by grace. Because that's what you are. You were a sinner. So we could rewrite the song and say, I was a sinner, now saved by grace. But I am, you are not a sinner, you're a saint now. But that's way ahead of the story. So let's go back to, to Genesis chapter 3.
I'm, I'm, I'm picking on I'm picking on songs again. So um, you know, picking on hymn writers, and I couldn't write I couldn't write a limerick, let alone a hymn. So I you know. You can write you, you can. There. Yeah. There, there, there was a man from Bellwood who. <laughs> Clean ones, yes, yes. Not the, not the ones I learned in high school. Okay, good, good, good man. Um, Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food, is pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also her husband with her, and he did eat. And sin enters. And it, 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 we studied volition two weeks ago on Wednesday night. Volition uh, comes to be in chapter 2 of Genesis, verse uh, 16, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, and the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. And God in that one action introduces volition, that is, not just the, the ability to make a choice, but the responsibility to choose. He put a tree in the garden and said, you have to choose whether you're going to eat the fruit of this tree. I, I put the tree there, it's available to you, it's accessible to you, you can, you can access it if you want, but I'm telling you, don't. So mankind now has to choose. Am I going to do what God said, or am I going to do what I choose to do? And of course we know, chapter 3, verse 6, the man and the woman, they saw that the tree was good for food, desired to make one wise, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. We've been through that many times. And the woman took of the fruit and did eat, and gave to her husband with her, and he did eat. And, and verse... Um, Eight and they heard the or verse seven. The eyes of them both were opened. They knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. They heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They hid themselves because they were ashamed and they were afraid and they knew now that they were naked. And that nakedness represents the guilt and the shame that they feel standing before a holy and a righteous God. And mankind becomes a sinner. Adam becomes a sinner. Eve becomes a sinner. And we turn to the book of Romans, and, and this becomes, this is a very, very, like the hypostatic union, that is, who Christ is, this becomes a very, very important part. These faithful sayings that Paul um, gives, uh, at least this one, uh, in, in great extent, it illustrates to us some of the great doctrinal discussions and debates and controversies through the ages of who Christ is and who we are, the nature of God, the nature of man, and how the two can come together and all of that. They're, they're, they're demonstrated and they're really solved in that, in that statement, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Romans chapter 5, Paul talks about how that sin is a problem. Wherefore, chapter 5 verse 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, what's Paul say there? Well, Paul says... Adam sinned in a very specific way. And the way Adam sinned was that God said this. God said, thou shalt not eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And mankind, represented by Adam, did that. He did exactly what God said, don't do. Now, but Paul also says, until the law... Sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. In the Garden of Eden, there was a law. There was only one law. The law in the Garden of Eden was, don't eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One law, one rule, one ordinance, one admonition of God, don't eat that. Mankind did exactly that. The similitude of Adam's transgression is that he violated a direct commandment of God. Now, so man is put out of the garden, so there's no longer access to that tree, or to the tree of life, or to any of the trees in the garden. And, but, but Paul says, so until the law, verse 13, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. So, all the way from Adam to Moses, there is no law. That is, there's no, there's no rule that says, thou shalt not. Yet, there was evil 
Um, keep your hand here in Romans 5. And this is, a, this is an interesting thing, and we're not going to have time to, you know, to, to drill down too far into it, but just, just to kind of point it out to you that this is, a, this is another thing people talk about and discuss. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. Now, Genesis 6 obviously is after Genesis 1, when Adam and Eve sinned, the similitude of their transgression violated the law of God. It's way before Moses gave the law to Israel, way before that. It's in that time when, when God is establishing these institutions of society that we're talking about on Wednesday nights. And, but it's in a time when sin is not imputed, when there is no law. But look what God says about man in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth... So there is no law, but there is wickedness. And that every heart and that, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So there is no law. These, these people in, in the days of the flood are not violating a law of God, but they are evil. And they are wicked. And they're doing wicked things. And, and, and part of it boils down to those, those four building blocks of society and those four institutions that God established there. They begin immediately to violate those. And we'll, you know, we'll talk about that more on Wednesday nights as we're going through that study. But they begin to violate those institutions and those ordinances of God that are set, not as commandments, but as the building blocks for society to function. And society breaks down. And every thought of man's heart was only evil continually. And if you go on in that passage, uh, in, verse, in chapter 6, and down to verse um, uh, I'll tell you, oh, verse 11 it is. And the earth was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with, what? <laughs> Violence. So those, those building blocks of society and those institutions were to provide for a peaceable, quiet existence. And when man abandoned those, the earth becomes filled with violence. So it's just an interesting twist on the idea that until the law, sin is not imputed, but there was still violence in the earth, and there was wickedness, and there was, uh, there was um, evil in the earth. But back to Romans chapter 5, that was kind of just an advertisement for Wednesday nights. Um, but back to chapter 5 of Romans, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now, death reigned. What, what brings death? Well, in, in chapter 6, Paul is going to tell you what? In verse 23, the wages of what? is death. So sin brings death. Nevertheless, verse 14 of chapter 5, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression. Even those that did not directly violate a law of God, they died. Because in Adam all died. Verse 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned, even though they haven't violated a direct commandment of God, they've still sinned. And man's response to that is, how can that be fair? How can it be fair for God to blame me, or Bernie, or Rhonda, well Rhonda, yeah, but, or, or anybody, any of us, how can it be fair for God to blame us and hold us accountable for Adam's sin. In Adam all have sinned, and in Adam therefore all die. How is that fair? And why would God do it that way? Why would he not just look at us as an individual and say, I'm going to hold you accountable for what you've done, and what Adam did is in the past. Well, a couple things about that. If you ask, and that's a legitimate question to ask. In Adam all die. Why? So a couple things about that. Number one, if you go back to Romans chapter 3, Paul has, has, has already told us this in Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. 
There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. That throws an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery in their ways. In the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. So he has given a description of man. That's a description there in Romans chapter 3. He's a description back in Romans chapter 1, verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. So those, there's two brief descriptions of, of, of man. And, and the point is this, that men, so, so I'm offended because God counts Adam's sin against me. Well then, let's just let God look at our life as an individual instead. So, so who wants to stand up and start at birth. This would take a long time if it's Bernie. Um, who wants to stand up and start at birth and tell us everything that you've done every day, all your life until this morning? Everything that you've ever done and every thought that you've ever had. Because you know, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And Jesus Christ said, you know, that you've heard it said of them of old time that you should not commit adultery, but I say if you look on a woman to lust after her in her heart, you've committed adultery with her already. So, so as you're going through this little recounting of your life, we're going to need to know not only everything you did, but we're going to, know every, we're going to need to know every thought that you had. And we're going to see if, in fact, you are a sinner in your own right. And if God were to judge you based upon you, instead of judging you based upon Adam, how would you make out? Adam committed one sin. How many have you committed? How many have I committed? How many have us collectively in this room committed? So you see, you, you don't make out any better if he looks at you, do you? You don't really make out any better. In fact, you probably make out substantially worse. Adam ate a piece of fruit. Um, we've probably all done some pretty nasty things compared to that. So that's, that's the first. Why is it fair for God to, to look at Adam and see me? And, and, you know, God, and, and, and God says, if you want me to do that, the, 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 the leading up to him saying there is none righteous, no, not one, is Romans chapter 2. Where he says this in verse 6, well, he's speaking of himself, God in verse 5, God, verse 6, who will render to every man according to his deeds. Verse 7, to them who by patient continuance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Eternal life. If you are, are continue by patient continuance and well-doing and you seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give you eternal life. So again, you're welcome to stay. I'll be glad to sit down and let you come up and you tell us how from day one, from the day of birth until this very day, you have sought only glory and honor and immortality and continued in patient well-doing every moment of every day of your life in the things you did and in the things you thought. And if you can do that, and if you can maintain it till the day you die, you know what? You will receive eternal life. So who has earned eternal life here? We would like to give you the award this morning um, for your attaining of eternal life. See, we all... So, so we say, well, it, God, it's not fair for you to count Adam's sin against me. But, but if God were to say, okay, I, I will just look at you then that would be okay too. Look, look at me, and you know where you'll end up? Same place. Same place. You're still, because you are a sinner. And, and your sin comes as a result of who you are. You do not, and we have say this many times, but it's so, so, so important. You do not become a sinner by sinning. You sin because you are a sinner.
the, our illustration is you know, if, a, if a duck walks down that aisle and comes up here and goes quack quack did it become a duck did, did it did it become a duck when it quacked yeah. mm -mm. it quacked because it is a duck and you know why it's a duck because its mommy was a duck and its daddy was a duck <laughs> and if a mommy and daddy duck have a baby you know what it is a duck <laughs> It's a duck. And you know what ducks do? They quack. And Adam became a sinner, and Eve became a sinner. And if a sinner and a sinner have a baby, you know what it is? Sinner. It's a sinner. And then if those sinners have more babies, you know what they are? They're sinners. And just like baby ducks quack, baby sinners sin. And we, we, we use this illustration. You never, you never at least intentionally teach your children to sin. Nobody ever says, you know, I never sat Ryan and Madeline down and said, now here's how you tell a lie. You have to look very honest, and you have to look sincere, and Madeline, you have to bat those big eyes in, at Daddy, and he'll believe anything you say, and that's how you tell a lie. But you know the first time something gets broke, or goes missing, or is out of place, and you walk in the room, and you say, who did that? <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not me, not me, I just got here. You know? Yeah. You don't really teach them that, do you? It's, it is who they are. And, and the sin, you know, th that verse in Revelation is so what was talking about being cast in the lake of fire, and it lists all the, you know, whoremongers and adulterers and blah, 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 and everybody says, oh, that's not me, that's not me. These people are getting cast in the lake of fire. And the last, the last thing is, and all, what? Liars shall have their place in, in, in the lake of fire that burneth with brimstone. Lying is the big one. And that's the one that, that's the first one your kids, that's the first time the sin nature comes out, isn't it? When they say, oh, I don't know, I don't know. So we sin because, so, so then why did God, if, if he can condemn us in, because of who we are individually, then why, why, at, why does he look at the, this, this Adam? Now, here's another thing, and there are two, because he says here um, in Romans chapter 5, uh, verse 14, at, at, after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. Now keep your hand here in Romans 5 and turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. That figure of him that was Adam was a figure of him that was to come. The one that was to come was the last Adam. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15 verse 45. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So there's the, there's the first man, Adam, that was created by God. That's the one in the Garden of Eden. And he was a living, God breathed into his nostrils, and man became a living soul. And that's Adam in Genesis 2-7. And then there is the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who was made a quickening spirit. In fact, he, he goes on to, to explain that, verse 47. The first man is of the earth, earthy. That's the one that was formed of the dust of the ground. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the last Adam is the Lord from heaven, Jesus Christ. And here's another, the theologians call those two Adams, the first Adam, the last Adam, federal heads. What in the heck is a federal head? Well, a federal head is someone that represents, we talk about the federal government in Washington, D.C., and we send representatives to the federal government. And that, those representatives, they represent a whole lot more. I mean, your, your representative in the House of Representatives, he represents the whole congressional district that he comes from, or she comes from. They are the federal government head over that district. And what, what they say or decide applies to... You don't get to vote on everything in Washington. But your, the federal heads do. The congressmen, the senators, the president is the federal head. Oh, the, when the president speaks, for better or for worse, he speaks on behalf of the whole nation. It's not just him saying it. He is the federal head of the whole nation. And Adam is the federal head 
of a group of people named sinners. <laughs> and Christ is the federal head of a group of people called saints. And God deals with man based on these two federal heads. Now, why is that? Why does he do it that way? Well, here's why. Because it, death reigned because of one man. That means life can reign. Go, go, back, go back to Romans 5 and on down in the passage. Verse 19. For as by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So in God's eyes and in God's mind, the disobedience of Adam made all men sinners. You say, well, that's not fair. So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Is that fair? Is it fair that the obedience of Christ gets counted to you and to me and to all who come? That's not fair either, is it? But if God views sin through the eyes of that one federal head, Adam, then he can view righteousness through the eyes of that one federal head, Jesus Christ. Because you see, if he viewed sin and righteousness through, through the lens of you as an individual, I'll pick on me this morning. If he, if he looks at Tracy and he says, I'm going to look at Tracy's sin. And, and, it has, and I, don't, I don't look at a representative of Tracy. I look at him. Then how would I pay for my sin? How would I? How could I? I'm a sinner. That's the point. I can't. I can't. There's no offering I can bring. There's no sacrifice. When David sinned, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me, which is another point about when do you become a sinner. <laughs> At, you know, and I think that's a real rant, this whole debate about abortion and when does life start and all that kind of stuff. David says, In sin did my mother, and this is kind of a roundabout way to get there maybe, when did David become a sinner? Conception. At conception. That means at conception, David is a separate human being, no longer his father, no longer his mother, but a sinner in his own right. <laughs> you know, and that, that's maybe a weird way to, to, to say you know, life starts at conception, but it's true. Because death, sin, starts at conception. And you can't have that till you have life. So anyhow, that's another story. But um, he, looks, he looks at us in Adam our headship, and we, if he looked at me, or if he looked at David, or if he looked at any of us and said, okay, I'm going to look at your sin, now fix it. We're done. We're done. We're doomed. We're destined for hell. There's nothing, unless we can do that thing in Romans 2, by patient continuance and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, then we'll earn eternal life. And unless we can do that, and we've already decided, everybody in this room, that boat sailed a long time ago. So the only hope for us is that he looks at us not as we are as an individual, but as looks at a federal head, looks at someone that can represent us. So he looks not at us as a sinner, but he looks at our father Adam and says, in Adam all have sinned and all die. But then he looks also at Christ. And he says, by one man's disobedience I declared you to be a sinner, but by the obedience of one, the last Adam, I will also declare you to be a saint. And if we turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Paul gives us the, the detail of that and the, 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 the mechanics of how that works. 2 Corinthians 5, 19, To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. God was in Christ. You see, it's not about us, it's about Christ. And God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing, tre your trespasses are not imputed unto you. God does not look at you as an individual and say, there is none righteous, no, not one. You're, you're traitors, you're heady, you're high-minded, you're adulterers, you're fornicators, you're lascivious, you're this, you're that. All, he is not imputing those sins to you as an individual. He said, I am going to take... <laughs> 
I'm going to appoint a federal head to represent all humanity. And that federal head that represents all humanity, I am going to take all the sin of all humanity for all eternity, and he will represent all, all of that filth and vile and all of those things that I, I say that, that mankind is. He will represent all that. And I will not impute it to mankind, but I will impute it to him. And then in verse 21, For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. I will make him to be sin through the obedience of one. I will make him to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of who? God, God our federal head. <laughs> in him. In him were made the in him our sin was paid for. He became sin for us through his flip over just a few pages to that uh, Philippians passage that we read earlier Philippians chapter 2 verse number 7 who made himself of no reputation took upon him the form of a servant was made in the likeness of men and being found in fashion as a man he humbled himself and became what's the next word obedient, obedient. through the obedience of one shall many be made righteous and you can say, well, it's not fair for God to blame me for Adam's sin. And that's, you know, who, who could worship a God that is so unfair and so unrighteous and, and to take the sin of Adam 6,000 years ago and count me guilty for it today. And that's fine. If you want him, want him to find you guilty for your own sin, have at it. Have at it. But understand, if he finds you guilty in Adam, that federal head, then he can also declare you righteous in Christ that federal head. Just like your sin, it's not your sin that makes you a sinner, it's Adam's sin that makes you a sinner, but it is not your righteousness that makes you righteous. It is Christ's righteousness. And if it is unfair for him to, to account and reckon Adam's sin to you, then it is certainly unfair for him to account and reckon Christ's righteousness to you, but we all would love to have that, wouldn't we? <laughs> so you can't you know, the old saying, you can't have it, speaking of sayings, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't have it both ways. He either counts you a sinner in Adam so that he can count you a saint in Christ, or he looks at your sin and counts you a sinner in you and who you are, and then there's no hope for righteousness. You're done. And it pleased God. One last passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the, the, the final piece of the puzzle. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 21. For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that what? Believe. So how, how this federal head, Jesus Christ, that paid for the sins of all mankind, how is it that you become a part of his headship over the church, the body of Christ, and his headship over all that are righteous? How is it that you become a part of that? It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. What pleases God? <laughs> to save them that believe. To save them that believe. It pleased God. God always does his good pleasure. <laughs> and it pleased God. By the foolishness of preaching. So you know, people tell me I'm a fool. I say, yeah, well, I'll, there it is. <laughs> All preachers, if they're preaching the truth, they are. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. To save them that believe. And you become identified with that federal head. Not the... The first Adam, who when Satan came, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, boom, slam dunk, beat him. That last Adam, when Satan came in the wilderness, lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride of life, get you, get you behind me, Satan. <laughs> it is written. That last Adam won the victory over sin and death. And in the first Adam, we die. But in the last Adam, we live. In the first Adam, we disobey. But in the last Adam, we obey. In the first Adam, we are sinners. But in the last Adam, we are righteous. And so Christ Jesus came into the world to be that federal head. The first Adam messed it up. 
horribly. But the last Adam came to be that life-giving spirit. The last Adam came to reclaim what the first Adam had lost. He came into the world to save, to reclaim sinners and make them his own. And the key to, to receiving that blessing, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. That message of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. It's all paid for in Christ. He was made to be sin that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when you believe it, that's, that's, that's the gospel right there. Christ died for sinners. And when we believe that and we trust that and believe he's our head and he represented me there on the cross that day, salvation is complete. Let's bow our hearts on a word of prayer. God and Father, again, we do thank you for Jesus Christ, and we thank you for the opportunity today of looking to your word. We thank you that Christ came to become that federal head, to take on him what wasn't his, all the sins of all mankind, that he might give mankind what wasn't theirs, his righteousness. And we thank you for it all in his name. Amen. All right, let's all stand and let's sing He is Lord as we're dismissed this morning. Don't forget the sign-up sheet is back there for the, uh, the concert in November and we hope to see you all there. Let's sing He is Lord as we stand. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead.